I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. Hallelujah, the place where we gather together to hear the prophetic words of the Lord and to make 11th hour decisions. I have a real important word for you today. If I can read my writing, I will get it across. If not, the Lord will interpret. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I want you to, uh, to get your notebooks if you have any and you want to write in your Bible, write in it. If you can't write in your Bible, write in your neighbor's Bible. if They got one beside you. And uh, <clears throat> I want you to, uh, to listen to this. Now, Father, we thank you for your word. I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word as we learn your word together as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you heard us singing a song a while ago about uh, we walked to the tabernacle of Moses, but we danced to the tent of David. You know, Moses and that tabernacle, it prophesied. Um, I'm trying to find a scripture here for you. It prophesied of suffering, the suffering of Christ to come. Because if you had walked through the tabernacle of Moses, what you would have saw, you know, it's in the shape of a cross. And it was as if Jesus had laid down in that cross and it kept pointing to the sacrifice to come, pointing to the sacrifice to come. You know, you went in through the way gate, then the truth gate, then the life gate. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's what he's referring to. And so when you walked in the way gate, you had the brazen altar, and the Scripture says his feet are burned as fine brass. Then you go to the laver, and you have, he said, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. You go on in the first covered tent, and then on the right side, if he's laying down, in his right hand would have been the menorah, and the Scripture said he holds the seven stars in his right hand, and his left hand would have been the table of showbread, the bread of his presence, which and he said, healing is the children's bread. Uh, then, then you would have walked up to the, the golden altar of incense with the red burning coals that represents the heart of God. And that would have been where his chest was and his head would have laid on the Ark of the Covenant. And that is the mind of Christ. And that would have been the cross. And if you stood up the tabernacle, it would have been a cross and him hanging on that cross. So Moses' tabernacle was pointing toward the sacrifice of Jesus to come. But David prophesied the celebration of life after he rose. Now, and, and the end of the sacrifices because, well, we'll, we'll get into it. Moses' tabernacle uh, was for the redemption of a stiff-necked people. While the tent of David was a look at grace. Now Uzzah, or Uzzah, however you call his name, Uzzah died from, from uh, steadying the ark. This was uh, controlling the ark, for it was riding upon a cart, a new cart pulled by oxen. Uh, now I want to show you something in 2 Samuel chapter Six is, I think, where we want to be. And um, look here, Second Samuel 6 is where we want. And verse, well, we'll look at uh, verse 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baali of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God. Now pay close attention as we go through this. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab and was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ahio, or Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and, a, and Ahio, or Ahio, went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps, on psalteries, on timbrels, on cornets, and on cymbals. And when they came to, the, to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to, to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. 
And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. That's a sobering thing, isn't it? And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah, or the breach on Uzzah, the breakthrough to Uzzah, to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him and to the city of David, but David carried it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, uh, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because the ark of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom unto the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord and had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city uh, of David, uh, it talks, uh, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked and threw, a, uh, through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he, he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women and men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed everyone to his house. Now, I want you to notice this. Here, like I said, Moses' tabernacle was for the redemptive, redemption of a stiff-necked people, while David's, uh, the tent of David, was a look at grace. Yuza died from steadying the ark. Now, this is the way. I want you to think about this. This was controlling the ark, for it was riding upon a cart, a new cart pulled by oxen. Now, it was riding on a new cart, and the oxen was pulling it. So it's a new way, a new cart. It's made out of big boards, wheels, and pulled by animals. And so the ark was sitting in the back of a new cart. But now watch this. The problem is, is that the ark of God is riding below the heart of a man. The ark of God is sitting below the heart of a man, and the man is sitting up on the cart above. His heart is above the ark. Now, they were controlling the ark. A man's heart was above the ark. God was having to go wherever these big wheels and boards were driving it. The soul of man, his thoughts, was dictating below to his heart then his heart down to the power of God. Now, this is what denominations have done for the most part. The Methodist church, for instance, I gave a prophetic word years ago about the Methodist church. I said there would be a great split in the Methodist church. I said it would split. It would split right down the middle over homosexuality. I said that how many years ago? And it was, it's online, you can find it. And sure enough, it happened, didn't it? Well, let me tell you what's going on, just to use this as an example. And maybe this message today will not only bring correction, but it'll bring direction, but it'll also bring repentance. The Methodist church, for instance, has placed God on a new cart, a new way, a new way of doing. They have placed their, their reasoning their thoughts by placing homosexuality above the moral standard of God. 
above the law of God, the moral law of God. They simply said there will be no, and the scripture simply says there will be no sodomite in the temple. It says that. It says it can't come there. Now, I want you to listen to this. It can't go up to the tabernacle. But a new card has been built and a new way that, that they can, they carried the Ark of the Covenant, the new way, placed the Ark of the Covenant, the third in the line below the thought of a man. Man has a thought, it goes to his heart, and then they put the power of God below it. Now, I want you to listen close to what I'm saying. They put it below the thought of a man. Instead of the animal instinct being sacrificed to God, it was now allowed to carry him. Oh, no, no I don't know if we heard that or not. But instead of the animals, the animals were pulling the ark, which set below the thought in the heart of a man. And instead of the animal, which represents the animal instincts, Instead of the animal instincts, the believer sacrificing it before God, now the animal instinct was allowed to, to pull God along and carry him. Now, I want you to think about that just a minute. It was allowed now to carry him. The hand of Yuza represents the hand of a man. The animal stumbled. And Yuza thought he had the right to steady it. They've taken the ark of God, they take the, took the power of God, and they put it upon a cart, a new cart. Oh, it's a new one. It's surely this new way should be accepted. It's brand new. And our big boards and wheels have absolutely uh, approved this thing, and we have allowed the animal instincts to be ordained and preach in our pulpits. And instead of the animal instincts, when the scripture plainly says that a sodomite can't come to the tabernacle, it talks about it all being an abomination before the Lord. But yet now the animal instinct, instead of being sacrificed, is allowed to be ordained and stood and carry God along. But the reasoning of a man and the heart of a man is above the power of God. And so, well, the board approved it, the church approved it, the, the, all the hierarchy approved it. And so when the animal instinct stumbles because it can't carry the moral law of God, and when it stumbles, the people driving it says, no, no, we can't let it go anywhere. We can't let it fall. We have to steady it with our own hands. So they had the power of God trapped between the thought and the heart of a man, an animal instinct and the control of boards and the control of a man's hand. Wonder what would have happened if the ark had have fallen, had have just fallen off the cart. That ought to make you think. What would have happened that day had it have fallen? So this is what's happened. Denominations. And I'm using the Methodist church because they did it. They did it till they split their church. Yuza died. And now the denomination is dying. And those that saw what they did ended up in David's line and broke away from the death and formed their own. And that was in the prophecy also. The Lord said, I will have a Holy Ghost Methodist church they'll be called something else. And now it's happened. Well, you shouldn't be talking about it, brother. Shut up. Be quiet. Listen to what the Lord is saying and let people live. Don't start patty cake and sugar coating, icing on a, on a, on a dead cake that's made up of maggots and flies. Putting icing over it. Well, you've baked the flies into the ointment. You've baked them. They're dead in the anointing oil. The flies are in the anointing oil and they're dying there. And you use the oil to knead the dough and knead the flour. And you break open all the pretty eggs and make your big pretty cake. And you cover it with icings of the boards and the animals and the big wheels and everything else. But yet when you cut into it, you're eating flies. 
Suppose the, the Lord let the ark fall. What would have happened? God cannot be lowered below a man's heart to be driven by an animal instinct. And those of you that have the nerve, keep listening. The Methodist church who once knew the power of God now has placed the ark. They have placed God below things, below their thoughts, and below their hearts by ordaining homosexuals. They are allowing their animal appetites to pull God along their way. They have him trapped between their thoughts, the animals, and a man's hand. To be steadied by the hand of a man. Do you know what else is happening here? They have created a prison to put people in. You say, how is that? To trap them in these lifestyles so that they can never see their destiny. For they are trapped between a man's depraved thoughts and the appetites of an animal, of animals and the control of a man's hand, all riding on the legislative boards of big wheels. Well, it produces death. And all the murdered destinies from all the people trapped between your depraved hands like Uzzah. Your denomination is dying, says the Lord. Like Eli, the time of the corrupted priest is about to give way to the time of the prophet. You keep people trapped. By this, letting these animal instincts run your, your big carts and wheels and try to hold the power of God in. Well, it killed it, didn't it? It killed it. And, the, and, one of the, and something that's happening that's terrible is the people that want out of those lifestyles, the people that want to see the destiny God has for them. You won't let them see it. You won't let them see it. Because every time they see the, the ark shake and the oxen stumble, you stick your hands up and steady it so that it looks right, it looks pretty, it looks great. And they say, surely if our leaders say it's okay, it's okay. And yet they go home miserable. And they lay at night and cry like the man in the tombs with an unclean spirit saying, help me God, help me God, help me God. And God tries to send help and you won't let them in. This is one of the most terrible things, that you're murdering destinies. You're destroying destinies of whole men and women's lives when God has something beautiful for them, something wonderful for them. But your political, religious, political hierarchy has surrounded trying to trap the power of God. Well, let it be known today, the power of God will not be trapped by big wheels and boards and pulled by animals and steadied by men. The ark, if it starts to move and you grab it, you are finished for the power of God is going to show up and the corrupt reign of Eli is going to give way to Samuels and Samuels are hunting Davids and David will be anointed all over this world in every nation, every culture every, every family there are Davids crying out to God anoint me Lord, I will do your bidding I will do your call and Samuels are about to take on the scene and go hunting Davids everywhere they go and Davids will rise up to be leaders, not just leaders in churches but leaders in political entities, leaders over nations presidents, governors uh, 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 all kinds of civil authorities will give way and it will be the time of Samuels and Davids. David recognized that what was being done was producing death. Now that's important. David realized when he saw a Uzzah die or Uzzah die, he looked and said, this is wrong. Something's wrong. Even David, the man after God's own heart, had been somehow moved into a place he thought it was okay to put that ark on that cart. David said, wait a minute. This produces death. 
This produces death. He said, so he returned to the ways of his fathers. You know, speaking of the Methodist church, you know the power of God and the Holy Ghost started first showing up in the Methodist church. They had revivals, miracles, power, everything. That's what Pentecostals were born out of. They started coming up out of the Methodist church, and now it's just, just a mess. David went and got the Levites to carry the ark the proper way on poles. Look, look, and listen now on poles and put it on their shoulders, which lifted the power of God above their hearts and above their minds, so that He could lead their thoughts, lead their hearts, and lead them where they go. Hallelujah. They put it on their shoulders above their hearts high enough that the mind of Christ, the Ark of the Covenant, would be high enough to shape their thoughts and go to their heart. David, now I want you to listen to this. David offered a sacrifice every six paces. Whoa. He danced and he danced. And if he just danced in a straight line, it had been 14 miles. And, some, uh, and one said he danced over 38 miles. Now that would mean he didn't dance in a straight line. If that happened, he just danced around in these steps all the way through. And, and get this, every six paces he would offer a, an ox and, and something. He would offer the sacrifice. Let, let's, let's see if we can find that. This is a really good point before we stop this today. Or before the Lord stops. In verse 13, And it was so that when they bear the ark of the Lord, when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. Now, let's just go with a conservative figure here. It was 30,000 paces from Obed-Edom's up to where it was going. From where they brought it to where it was going to David's house. 30,000 paces. That means every six paces, David would have offered, uh, offered uh, the oxen and fatlings. Then by the time he got to where he was going, on a conservative figure, he had offered 3,500 sacrifices. So behind him was a trail of blood that went all the way back to where they picked it up at. And David was out in front of it. And the blood was leading the trail all the way to where the ark would sit. And the blood could be seen. And so David, think about that. He would have offered on a conservative figure 3,500 sacrifices. And that's something. David offered a sacrifice every six paces. Showing the animal appetite was sacrificed every six paces. David danced something like, I said, 14 point something miles conservative. If he danced around more than just in a straight line, he could have doubled that. And someone said he danced 38 miles, and that may be the actual mileage. But listen to what he said. Uh, when he did this, I want you to hear this, righteousness had returned to the people. The animal appetites were sacrificed. They returned to the ways of their fathers. They had a great celebration. The ark never returned to the tabernacle of Moses after this. Prophesying, this was a prophecy that the time of the temple veil would be rent in twain, revealing there was no ark behind it. There was no ark behind it when that temple veil was rent. It was a prophecy showing it had left the tabernacle and was now in the hearts and homes of everyone. 
who understood the blood. At the end of the bloody trail, it was in your home. Oh, come on, y'all. That ought to, somebody ought to get that. It had gone, now the ark had gone from the shoulder of a man into the heart of a man. And that's where we are today. And to try to go back to all of that. Because you need to really see this. It said, as the ark came into the city of David, he came in, Saul's daughter mocked him. Well, you know what happened to her. She was barren. So all the people mocking us for doing this, bringing in, preaching righteousness, preaching holiness, mocking us, it said they were, she was barren. She never had a child. Could never produce anything else. And so when they brought this in, I want you to notice this. As soon as David had made an end of the offerings in verse 18, well, verse 17, we'll close with this. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place and in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered, now you've got to pitch a place for, the, for God to sit in your home, in your heart. David offered burnt offerings, peace offerings before the Lord, and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, and he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to women and men, to every one a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, every one to his house. There was a great celebration when it returned, and full provision was given. People had provision again. They had plenty to eat, plenty to drink. They were happy, and, and all we had returned, they had returned to the ways of their fathers. And David, Moses was prophesying the cross to come. David was prophesying when the one who rose from the dead would live in your home, in your heart. And so this is where we stand today. And we see denominations, not just, listen to me, you need to take heed, take heed. Any denomination going that way, you better not put the power of God below your heart. It better ride above it. It better ride above it because it will produce death and take it from what happened in the Methodist church. Could these people repent? Yes, they could. But now there's a new name for a new organization, and it's all changed. It's all changed. And people get mad at the preaching of righteousness. And one of the things that really bothers you is they're trapping people in these lifestyles, saying it's okay. And when they lift their eyes in hell because they really don't know Jesus, See, there's only one sin will keep you out of heaven, and that's not knowing Jesus. And this is all designed to keep your heart above God, creating God in your, in your own image. Well, you know, brother, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do to make homosexuality right. Just like there's nothing you can do to make the slaughter of the unborn right. I don't care how much you stand up and how much you blare your eyes out and how much you, you protest and whatever you say and this, uh, this nasty, corrupt mess where they stand up and simulate abortions in front of crowds and drop the baby out from between their legs, a bloody piece of meat somewhere, and rejoice over the fact. Do you realize what you're doing in front of heaven? Do you? There's nothing on a man to receive. It wasn't Adam and Steve in the garden. It was Adam and Eve. There's nothing on a man to receive. If I was to describe the homosexual act one man did on television and they went berserk. Well, if you believe in it so much, tell how it's done. Nothing on a man to receive. It stops life. It just quits life from producing. 
And that's all the enemy's about. Stop life. Stop life. There's nothing on a woman to give seed like that. She receives. The man is a seed sower. And the two together make a picture of God. And it's all designed to stop life. The killing of the unborn is to stop life. It's just to stop life. And now and mutilating the genitals of children is to stop life. How do you justify that one? It's got so ridiculous men marry a moose. How do you justify that? You better watch out. That moose will kick your head, slam off. You don't mess with stuff like that. Anyway, hallelujah. I could go on and on, but hallelujah anyway. So we need to take these lessons. We need to learn what we're, what's being said here. And when you see politicians promoting, placing a man's heart above God, you better take heed. Nobody, but I will tell you this. People in a homosexual lifestyle, God has a destiny and a call for you. And you've been lied to. You've been cheated by the most, most of the organizations. They're trying their best. They know if they, can't, if they don't have you as a slave, they have no power to control political entities. People that's in witchcraft, sorcery, your witches, warlocks, all this kind of stuff, you're being lied to. You can't curse what God's blessed. But remember, when demons are sent out to destroy lives, that's what they're commissioned to do. And when they hit a believer who understands the blood and the name and the Holy Ghost, you do know that your puny imps of hell are no match for the Holy Ghost. And as soon as it braces up against that and it realizes there's nothing I can do to them, it starts asking. Let me go into the swine. Let me go into the swine. And that's what Satan considers you, swine. And they, they turn and rend their own. And those demons turn on the ones that sent them. Thus the scripture says, he who digs a pit will fall in it. And he who rolls a stone as a trap, it'll roll back on them again. So you've been lied to. You've been lied to. You were enticed. Wiccans, witches that are Wiccan, Wiccans? Wiccan, wicker means twisted. Twisted, that's what wicker means. So if you call yourself a Wiccan, you're twisted. And they only drew you in because they figured you were losers. That you had nothing. You would never have nothing. They catch people depressed. They catch people that have nothing seeming to live for. And they promise them all kinds of things. And they promise them something. And they appeal to their animal appetites. And they all go out in the woods and get naked, wrap oak leaves around their head, dance around a fire, and just see whatever develops. And they go from week to week like that. But it gets old. And after a while, they realize sin lets them down. And they become suicidal probably. And the whole time, God has a plan and a destiny. And all these things are designed to keep you from it. Why don't you start right now today? You have to understand something. All of this is designed to notice the oxen is to treat you like an animal with all your animal instincts that you're operating in. And all of it's like the herd of swine so demons can fill them. And that's something. And so you, you, have to, you have to break that. See something bigger for your life than that. You're not an animal and you're not a swine. You were created in the image and the likeness of God. He has a whole plan for you. He has a future so bright for you that it includes children, family. It includes a destiny. It includes prosperity. It includes everything that you could possibly desire to be happy. There's nothing like 
seeing, sitting under your own vine or your own fig tree. There's nothing like that gives God great pleasure. There's nothing like seeing your children grow up before you and succeed in their life. There's nothing like that. Nothing like that. I remember when they said one group said, uh, we can't do our gay parade if you can't do lewd acts and all this in front of the people as you pass by. They said, well, we just won't do it then. That ought to tell you something. Why does people get on a parade float and stick a ball in their mouth and tie a leather around their head and wear uh, clothes that's just barely on them while they simulate sex acts going down in front of children. What is that about? That's what you promote? No, that's Satan treating you like ox and swine. That's all that is. He treats them like swine. Why would somebody, why would some man have a three-day stubble on his face and put on a wig and paint his lips with red lipstick and wear a dress and go up to Congress and dare in front of the nation ad try to address Congress and say they don't even know what, you know, they can't, none of them can even define what a woman is? Well, I guess they can't. What would make them do that? You want to tell you what makes them do that? Satan has him a herd of swine, and he treats a human, and that ought to enrage people in the spirit, that he treats humans like animals, like swine. He, in the very beginning when man fell, there was only five levels of authority, God, man, angels, animals, and plants, and when Adam bowed his knee to Satan, Satan shoved him down the line as far as he could shove him. He would have put him to the dust, but dust can't bleed. Turnips can't bleed. You can't get blood out of a turnip. So he pushed him to the lowest level, an animal. And right then, Satan yoked a man like an ox and began to plow his furrows with men. Men who were created higher class than he. Men who are in the image of God, not of an angel. And so he begins to treat them like animals. And he say, he gets them dress up like this, look like this, look like a fool, try to go get their children. And while you're at it, just cut the genitals of your children up and make them something they're not. And do this and do that and, and, and ordain these people in the pool, ordain homosexuals to preach this lifestyle and keep everybody in bondage. Do this, do that. Uh, uh, go into Wiccan worship. Go into witches. Uh, be, become a witch. Become a naked witch in the woods. Go out here and go out here and catch every uh, every uh, STD you can out in the middle of the woods because the people that's joined you are people that, that just live this kind of lewd lifestyle. He's yoking people like animals, and he treats them as ox and swine. Listen to me. Look at me a minute. You say, Brother Robin, you talk crude. Yeah, I do. But when you got all these things going on, am I talking any cruder than they're dressing? Am I speaking any cruder than they're doing? No, I'm not. But I want you to look at me, people, people. You hear me call you people? You're not swine. You're not animals. You're human beings. You're in the image and likeness of God. But even a stagnant pond can reflect an image. And even if you're doing that, men can reflect God, so it makes God look foolish to people. Satan uses that as a tool to try to make God look foolish. But even a stagnant pond can reflect God, can reflect a man's image. And even a lost man can reflect God, but he cannot reveal God. And so God created you to not only reflect him, but reveal him. So I'm talking to people. You're not animals. You're not these things that men tell you you are. You are created in the image and likeness of God. And right now, I want you to know that. And I want you to know that God loves you so much that Jesus would have died for only one if necessary. 
He considered it. He loves you that much that he would have died just for you. He would have done everything he did for you if that's what he needed to do. And just to give you a choice not to make you do anything. Some of you pastors in these churches, some of you pastors in these churches that are smoking dope, living like you do and all this kind of stuff, ordaining all this mess and doing all of this. Or do you, oh, yeah, we want to ordain homosexuals and watch two women kiss in the pulpit wearing your tallits, but they're rainbow colored. Really? Elijah would have never split a water by hitting it with that. He'd have drowned, sure as the world. He'd never made it through. Here's the thing you do. You pastors doing that, you could get saved. You could get saved. Your organization didn't save you. Just because you're a Methodist, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, or whatever you may be, Pentecostal, and you were ordained under these organizations, that didn't save you. That didn't save you. Lester Summerall, in his own testimony, uh, preached and preached and preached and saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds saved before he was ever saved. Because the gospel can get people saved, just telling it. But when he saw that people were going to hell, everything changed for him. Read his life story. Most powerful man of God we've probably seen in this whole century. Well, you could get saved too. You could get saved out of all this. You could start a spiritual revolution in your Methodist church in the morning. You could walk up there and just preach this. Well, I don't know how to preach it. I don't even have the nerve to preach it. Cut this video out and show it to your congregation. I guarantee you it'll start something. But then stand up and say, we're going back to the ways of our fathers. We're going to see the power of God that John Wesley talked about. We're going to see the power of God that these men and women of God talked about. The old circuit riders preached that. We're going to see that. And give the people a chance to live. Would you just give them a chance to live? Let them have a choice. At least give them a choice. If you don't give them a choice, you make it for them. And try to raise a generation of babies. You'll answer to God for that. Those are his heritage. You better watch it. Support the mutilation of babies in the womb and sell their body parts. You better watch it. That goes all the way back to child sacrifice and Moloch and Baal. Are his Baal worship still alive and well? Yes. Every time a child's aborted, it's sacrificed to Baal. Every time. Now, I want you, the people, I'm calling you people, persons, humans that God loves, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me, and I believe you rose from the dead to set me free. And I confess with my mouth, today, right now, you are my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of all sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Give me a brand new start. Show me your destiny for me. I choose to follow you from this day forward forever. Hallelujah. Now, if you believe that, then you just got born again. And there's not a power in hell that can keep you away from your destiny. Get you a Bible. Start reading the book of St. John, chapter 1, first of all. Read that first. And read it as if God's talking to you. And see what he, he, how he is and what he does. And you'll know he's absolutely good when you get over to St. John 14, 8 and 9, when he says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And it's a personal, take it personal. But you know, you say, well, I need more power in my life. Well, don't stop 
Don't stop at just being born again. Then get baptized in the Holy Ghost like Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit of God came in and sat down on each one of them with cloven tongues as a fire and say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost. Just ask that. See, when you got saved, the Holy Ghost baptized you in Jesus. That's what just happened to you. But now you can get Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Ghost in fire. And it cuts this power loose on the inside of you, man. And it'll come up on you, and you'll have staying power, resisting power, uh, all kinds of power coming from the Spirit of God himself. Say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives me utterance. And now just start thanking him. Thanking him for doing it. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And then just stop right there and just start doing it in other tongues, whatever you hear. Just coming up out of your spirit, whatever sound you're listening to. How powerful is that? How powerful is that? Someone was visiting someone in a, in a mental ward they were drawing on their face with lipstick just ignoring them they're trying to minister to them and the person looked at them and didn't know what else to say so they just started praying in tongues when they did that thing that person stopped with that lipstick and this voice came out of them and said you pray in a language you speak in a language that we can understand she began to, or that person that was praying in tongues began to speak with power, with the utterance of the Holy Ghost, who's praying mysteries hidden in God. And it made that devil scared. Hallelujah. So today is a day of deliverance. Today is a day of truth. And today is a day of your decision. Amen. And if you made that decision, write to us, would you? You can email us. Just email me at robindbullock.com. There'll be an email address on there. And, and get the little booklet, Jesus, Why It Is the Way It Is. I think you can download it there. Uh, I ask that every time. Uh, but I'm sure you can, right? Yes, they're shaking their head yes. Go to the product page. That's a free download. It costs you nothing. And if you can't do that, uh, email us. A write to us on the address, there's a physical address, and we'll mail you one out wherever you are in the world, just free of charge. Hallelujah. And that don't automatically stick you on a mailing list either. That just gives you something that you can have. And if you want to receive more material, request it. But other than that, that's what you'll get. And you'll get our prayers. Partners that join with us as partners. I pray over you every day. I carry your names with me. I've got to get it updated this week because this is an old list, but I ask the Lord to honor it because of all the new. And I, I pray over you every day. I'll be praying over you today. I did yesterday. Hallelujah. God is absolutely good. I don't want you to forget that. I want you to know more about that. Amen. Krista, come on and receive our offering today. And um, God wants you to prosper too, you know. He does. He wants you to prosper. And he has a way that no bank, no job, nothing can hold you back from prospering. Krista's going to tell you about that. Amen. Amen. Krista's going to tell you about that. Praise God. Krista, with the unction of the Holy Spirit, is going to tell you about that. <laughs> Praise God. Well, we want to thank you all for tuning in today. Like I always say, it is it is an honor to be with you on the other side of this camera. We we know that you're with us every Tuesday. We never take it for granted, and so we're we just. We love coming together as our 11th hour family. You know, before I get into the offering, I, I want you to know that we are coming to a few places uh, this year than the next coming up months, uh, actually the next few days for some. So hopefully some of your faces on the other side of that camera, we will get to see. Uh, this weekend, we'll actually be in uh, around the Choctaw, Philadelphia, Mississippi area at... Um, 
an amphitheater on the Choctaw Indian Reservation. And so that, that's really awesome. The uh, social media team has got that posted on the Robin D. Bullock uh, Instagram and Facebook, so you can go and get the information there. It also has the website. Next weekend, which would be May 26th, will be Brunswick, Georgia. And that will be with Miles Kilby Ministry, and that's going to be awesome. So if you're around that area, come see us. Also, this weekend, uh, May, I believe it's May 19th, Dad will be on a Zoom meeting via Zoom with a church in Switzerland. So we'll be posting the, the link for that, and that that's going to be awesome too. So we'll, I've got to get all the time of... Uh, Time differences lined up so that you know when to tune in. I know when to tune in so because I think it's like if it's 10 a.m. here, it's like 7 there or something like that. I, I'm not sure, but we'll get all that information posted for you. So hopefully out of all of that, on the other side of that camera, we'll get to see your faces. And so we're looking forward to that. But you know what? We never like to close a broadcast without giving you the opportunity to sow. Why? Because not for us for you because you there are things that see seed time and harvest is something that will never cease seed time and harvest is so real uh, it's like i said last tuesday if a lot of people really realize that if that was really true on the inside of them they would never do some of the things they do and they would never say some of the things that they say. They would never act the way they act at times because it's not real to them. You know, we have in the scripture uh, the account of Jacob seeing the ladder. And he said, this is a dreadful place. Angels going up, getting harvest, bringing it back. Going up, getting harvest, bringing it down. And what he was saying was, I better watch what seeds I sow because this is real. Now, this is just in Christus terms, but this is real life. And this is really happening every single day, night and day. Angels are going up getting the harvest that you and I have sown the seeds for and bringing it back. And not, I think everybody forgets, maybe not everybody, but a good bit, that the devil can go and get that harvest he's an angel he he's an angel just because he fell from heaven does not mean that he he's not that being anymore he's not that kind of being he's still a spirit being he with the fallen angels he still operates in that world he is a reaper where do you think you get the grim reaper from it's him. That's all he wants to do. But he comes for your bad harvest. He never wants you to have your good harvest. So when you're sowing your seed according to the word of God, he don't, he don't want to bring that harvest to you. But there are angels that do. There are angels that go get that harvest and bring it to you. And you know every time it makes him furious. So we need to remember that seed plant harvest is more real than you and I. It, it's more real than you and I. Why? Because it was here before you and I were. And it's the reason we're here. It's the reason every single thing in this studio is here. Seed plant harvest. In the physical and the spiritual. And it operates in both worlds. And so... Don't let yourself get caught up in all that's going on around every single one of us. You know, there are winds and waves and storms every single day. Every day you wake up. Every day you wake up, you could, you could look around you and see. All you got to do is just open one of these apps on your phone, and there's winds and waves. Don't let yourself get distracted. Because when you get distracted on the winds and the waves, you're sowing seeds you don't even remember that you sowed. And here comes the devil to go get that. Because you think he's going to miss going and getting your bad harvest? That's his favorite thing to do. 
is go get your bad harvest. He's got a harvest coming for him too. He has one big one, and I, I've already requested a front row seat to watch the day that that happens. You don't think that front row will be big enough for everybody? Everybody's probably got a front row seat to watch that, to watch that big kaboom in that fire. He don't, he don't look forward to that. And so he's running around like crazy trying to get your bad harvest to you first. So at least he's got something to look back on and go, well, you know, I made their life miserable. I made their life miserable. Don't let him succeed at his job. It is to our shame that we let him succeed. And it's just because we get distracted in day-to-day -day life. And he counts on that. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who is constantly calling you forward. He's constantly calling you to him, saying, come on, if you'll just keep your eyes on me, there is everything you need, prosperity, spiritually, physically, and financially. And he's telling you, keep sowing. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Because in due season, you will reap if you faint not. If you quit looking at the winds and the waves, you will reap your good harvest. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep your eyes off the winds and the waves and walk. Because we were called to walk on the water, not drown in it. So, today, and I meant so as an S-O, we're going to S-O-W today. We're going to sow our seed into good ground for our good harvest. And you, you know what? Today, after you sow, you're going to tell the angels that are sent to go get your good harvest, Go get it and bring it to me. Go get angels of the Lord that are sent to minister for Krista Jordan Bullock. Go get my good harvest and bring it to me. And I plead the blood over any bad harvest that I may have sown for, whether knowing or whether not knowing. I plead the blood over it, and I send a blanket of praise out over that, and I cancel that out of my life. I rip it up by the root. It will not grow up in my life, but only a good harvest that I have sown for. And we call for that for our 11th hour partners today. We call for that good harvest to come up and grow up in their life. That they see. They see it. They see what they've sown for. They see the, the things even that money couldn't buy grow up in their life. And they say, only God could have done this for me. And I thank you for that, for all of our 11th hour partners, that their best days are ahead of them. And they are not behind them. Lord, I give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. Well, Luke 6, 38 says that as you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tithe, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith it, the Lord of hosts say I believe it I receive it I call it done in Jesus name amen so be it praise God hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah well it's been a good 11th hour today hasn't it 
It's been a good time to be here. And, um, you know, you know, the Lord always makes a pull for people because he wants people free. The biggest thing he wants is to see people free. Hallelujah. To be able to take advantage of what he died to, to give them, what he rose again from the dead to accomplish. That is an awesome thing. And um, that's what he wants to see more than anything else. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you today. Um, if, you, if you're not a partner with the 11th hour or with the ministry here, then you can go on the website and I, you can follow the steps there and become one. All you have to do is go to robindbullock.com and you click on the proper tabs and it'll tell you how to become a partner. Now, when you become a partner with this ministry, you go on the list that we pray for constantly every day. I pray for you every day. And um, we, we um, I, I study to bring you things. I want to know, I want to tell you what God's doing. And then we want you to pray for us. And it's not just financial giving, but people give and they support the ministry and it allows us to go further. And that's awesome, but you know, if somebody says, well, I don't want to give, well, you don't have to. Uh, but, but a partner is to pray, is to support and to help. And we are to pray and support and help in every way that we can. But we become partners. And you know, if someone has one anointing, someone has another anointing. And when they come together, suddenly they create an anointing. That's, there's an anointing God creates that didn't exist before and that we both can walk in. Partnership is, is covenant relationship. So anyway, I was led. I never say anything about it, uh, really, but I was led over there to, uh, by the Lord to tell you if you'd like to be a partner, just go to the website and follow the, the steps. Amen. Well, we love you, and I want you to know that we love you. And uh, you are our partners. You are our family. And so, but you are God's people. Amen. And until next time we gather together, right here around God's Word, I want you to remember something. Don't be afraid. Don't let this world push you into a, a panic. Don't get into uh, this doomsday that there's no way out. To say it's hopeless would be to say God is helpless, and He's not helpless. And Jesus said, you made me hope when I was on my mother's breast. So He's our hope. His name will deliver us. Philippians 2, 9, 10, and 11. Look that up and commit it to memory. Amen. Well, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Commit that to memory because that's the love chapter. Faith works by love. Amen. Well, until next time we gather together right here around God's Word, I want you to remember, or wherever we see you at around God's Word, remember that Jesus loves you. We love you. Jesus loves you huge, and we love you as huge as we can, and we know as we know how. Amen. You are precious to us. And never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom. Shalom.